right. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Fireside Chat, a chat with the experts. Today, we have our head honcho of creative, Dr. Bill Cardoso. And I'm assuming I'm the official host. So I'm Megan Bergsma. There is a debate as to whether or not I demoted David Kurdoff as host. So I guess I'm going to officially say it out there. I am the official host. So he'll take my place when I can't be here. (laughs) I guess. There you go. It matters. I just got thrown into this role and I and I haven't left. <laughs> all right. And for today's topic, it's all about aerospace and how x-ray can be a good part of that into the inspection of it. And we have a really cool ho- uh, cool feature, uh, feature guest, uh, Keegan Carl from Dark Arrow. So welcome, Keegan. All right. Thanks for having me. Yeah, anytime. And you're ca- you're tuning in from Wisconsin, right? Correct. Oh, Wisconsin. Right. Yeah. So I'm just gonna kick this off and just ask, how did Dark Arrow get started, and why Dark Arrow? What what where is that name um, originated? Yeah. So Dark Arrow started. Uh, officially, kind of back in 2017, the company consists of myself and my two other brothers. Uh, we started moonlighting it a little bit before that when we had our full-time engineering jobs, but we, we went full-time on it in 2017. Uh, we're an aerospace company, so we're building a, a kit aircraft. Uh, and what that means is that we build um, no more than 49%. And then we ship that as a series of parts to a customer and then the customer assembles it into a complete aircraft. Uh, the name Dark Arrow came about kind of because when we first started the company, we were working in secret. So it's kind of like we're working <laughs> in the dark or moonlighting, yeah. if you will. But then also we have a, a collective interest in space and space exploration and just adventure. And there's a lot out there in the universe uh, that we don't know about, um, including like dark matter, dark energy. And then a lot of what we do is with carbon fiber, which is a black material. So we thought it was just a very uh, fitting name for us, uh, dark arrow, and hence, you know, aerospace. So that's kind of how it came about. uh, You said you started this, so go ahead, Bill. (laughs) All right, so I, you did mention that you started this company with your your brothers. So all of you are engineers. And when you came about starting this company with them, they're like, let's just do this. And and how, how does that work with all of you being engineers and all of you being related? Yeah, we're, we're all two years apart. We all went to school and got different uh Degrees in engineering, Riley did aerospace, and then I did mechanical and River did electrical. That wasn't like a planned event. It was just our areas that we were interested in. Uh, we all, after graduation, went and worked in industry. We we actually didn't even live in the same states, but then we all somehow ended up back in Madison, Wisconsin, which is where we started Dark Arrow. And Riley was building a different experimental kit aircraft. Um, When we had all graduated and we were kind of separated and not in the same city, we made it a point to still get together and go to the the air show up in Oshkosh, Wisconsin that they do each year. And we have conversations about different aircraft and uh, different aspirations for, you know, maybe a better aircraft or one that was more desirable, at least from our perspective. And we were kind of waiting around each year we went to see that aircraft and then we never did. So um, around the same time, we all ended up back in the same area, and that uh, generated a lot more hangout sessions and, and discussions about starting a company, specifically an aerospace company. And we thought maybe there'd be something there, given our different um, diverse backgrounds or backgrounds in engineering. So, yeah, we started moonlighting it, uh, experimenting with carbon fiber uh, and just testing out different materials and started building some of the equipment for it. And then as we got further and further along and kind of gained more confidence in what we were doing and the direction we were heading, we decided to yeah jump in on it full time. That's so, awesome. So, so what is basically that have brothers go into engineering, right? 
right, Bill? Exactly, helps. What is that aircraft you're looking for that you couldn't find in Oshkosh? Yeah, we, so in the, so the aircraft market, there's different, I guess, categories you can kind of break it up into. Yeah. So you have the commercial aircraft market, which is probably what most people are familiar with. It's like your big Boeings and your Airbus, the, the aircraft that you get on and fly commercially. Uh, then there's general aviation that includes like private jets and small little two seat aircraft or four seat aircraft that are more personalized. Um, so when we go to the air show, they have a whole spectrum of aircraft, but we were interested in personal aircraft or like a private aircraft. Uh, we never thought we could afford like a private jet. Yeah. That would be kind of ideal and really awesome. But uh, if you look at like more, I guess, humble type of aircraft, like a two seat aircraft, something you train in to get a private pilot's license, they're they're not very um, modernized, if you will. They're they're kind of decades old kind of technology the, yeah. the design was kind of made and certified a long time ago um but that's where the experimental market is kind of interesting and kind of exciting because there's a lot less uh, faa restrictions as far as what you can do to bring them an aircraft to market and fly it yourself so uh, when we go to the air show we we're looking for something that was a little bit more modern had modern materials was using modern technology to build it uh, had a little bit more speed and range, and that was kind of what we were after. And we just didn't see anything that really caught our eye. And um, not trying to knock previous kits, there it's very hard to bring a new kit aircraft to market. Um, but the the build process becomes a big portion of of ownership, and you can spend a lot of time building an aircraft. And for the aircraft that are more kind of speed and range oriented, they're typically composite aircraft and those that composite work can be very labor intensive and very intimidating so our goal is to create a new modernized kind of aircraft that use more modern materials but then also creates a more enjoyable build experience at the same time yeah that's so cool i can ask a question but uh i was just wanting to ask a question after you so no go ahead yeah ask the question uh, well, I have too many right, questions. So, we're going to be here yeah. all day don't worry about uh, it <laughs> <laughs> so uh you did mention that your particular aircraft is composed of carbon fiber can you tell us like what is the advantages and disadvantage of that kind of composite when crafting huh, your aircraft yeah, carbon fiber is awesome because it's really uh, lightweight, it's really strong, and it's really stiff. Uh, but then, uh, I heard this saying, and I'm going to steal it, but when you're designing a part that's made out of carbon fiber, you're not only designing the part, but you're designing the material at the same time. So you have to combine carbon fiber with the resin, and then you have to harden those or cure them, and then it becomes a final part. In the process of doing that, there's a lot of different variables that can affect the uh, strength and stiffness of that part. So the advantages of it is that you get a really lightweight, strong part, but then the disadvantage is that you have to do a lot of work up front to kind of verify that that material is, um, I guess, up to up to your standards. When you when you buy a piece of metal, uh, it's already been standardized, so like a 6061 T6. Everyone's already agreed on its material properties and its curing and temperature uh, tempering. Um, but with composite, it's kind of like the Wild West. There's still a lot of uh, variability there in terms of the final end product that you can get. So you have to you have to do a lot of work up front to kind of verify that. So that would be kind of a big disadvantage. So there can be a lot of uh, development time that goes into into that. Yeah, my question was um, related to the experience, right? So you, you, I buy a kit, for example, and what kind of garage space do I need and how much time is it going to take me to, you know, from the point I get a crate in my garage, asking for others, right? Ask for a friend to a point where I'm, I'm flying an airplane. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so the kind of the problem that currently exists with kit aircraft is that if you want a kit aircraft that's very uh, fast and has high speed, long range, 
of, first of all, there's not a lot to select from. And if you are selecting one, the, the build process is pretty messy. And, uh, you could be sitting there sanding, uh, doing a lot of filling, and you'll probably build up some, some jigs and some pictures to get everything aligned. And what we're trying to do is you are going to get like one or two uh, base kits, like a fuselage kit and a wing kit. And then uh, a lot of your work is just more assembly, kind of like a Lego kit or like an Ikea kit, yeah. if you will. Uh, for garage space, we designed it to be built in a like a modern or a standard two-car garage. So if your garage is 20 feet by 20 feet, you should be able to build it in your garage and then do final assembly at an airport. So eventually you're gonna you're gonna want a hangar anyways for the aircraft. Yeah. So that's where you kind of attach your wing and uh, get everything bolted together for the final stage. So you'd be able to trailer it there to the airport at that point. Uh, total build time we're targeting around 1,500 hours. Uh, so it's a uh, it's considered a quick build kit. So a lot of it is just uh, kind of like bolt and bonding items together. And. It, are you going to ship with a glass cockpit or is that up to the user to figure out what kind of instrumentation you're going to put on the plane? Yeah, so from our end, we provide all of the composite structures. So that includes like the wing, the airframe, uh, the landing gear, and then uh, hardware and then adhesives to put that together. And then Purchase separately, we have uh, relationships built up with all their uh, suppliers. So the engine, you'd have to purchase separate. And then the instrumentation, like the avionics, you'd have to purchase separate. And then the wheels and brakes would be separate as well. Uh, the canopy is something that we provide, though, with the kit. Um, mm -hmm. So we're not experts on on engine manufacturing or, or avionics. So we kind of leave that to the experts. and. That's kind of one area where customers can kind of customize their kit a little bit. If they want like a VFR setup or an IFR setup, they can kind of customize their avionics to fit their needs for that nice aircraft. Nice. So we can be our mini version of John Travolta's like jet, right? Well, That's he has like 10, <laughs> less 737 and we're not going to go there. Yeah, it's, it's nuts. That's pretty No, cool. we're not going to go there yet. We're not there yet, but yes, exactly. good dreams. Um, I definitely want to go to the part where um, we were able to send our x-ray van over to you guys. And I just kind of wanted to give, uh, give you an opportunity to tell our, our followers, um, how, did you, how did that experience go? And what did you find out? What, what was your learning experience? Yeah, they they were great. Um, we had a couple samples ready to go, and we didn't really know what to expect because we never X-rated any of our parts before. Um, so we had a kind of a sampling of different parts um, from some of our metal machine components to our carbon fiber structures, and it was insightful being able to essentially look inside of them. So we make these. I should have grabbed one before we got on the chat, but we make these uh, honeycomb sandwich panels, for example. Mm -hmm. So it's like a, a layer of carbon fiber and then a honeycomb structure, kind of like what you see with like a cardboard box. You know, it has the kind of wavy yeah. material in between. Um, and then it has another layer of carbon fiber on the bottom. So it creates the sandwich panel. And once you close that off, you can't see inside of it. Um, so it's kind of sealed up. So we were able to examine uh, a couple of those that we had made that we had brought to air shows and different um, different vendor events and we had actually used it as a sample for people to try to break it's really light and it's really stiff so people try to bend it over their knee and stuff and what we could see through the x-ray was on the edges of the material was a little bit of minor buckling in the honeycomb material and we would never have been able to see that um had we you know unless we had destroyed the part itself uh, so that was interesting to see, and it kind of gave us some more insight into uh, a potential failure mode, like a buckling failure mode, for example. And then we have some other parts that we actually make with a combination of milled carbon and epoxy, um, almost like 3D printing. And that process that we use can introduce uh, voids in the material. So we use it for some of our non-structural kind of cosmetic cockpit parts. And we scanned one of those, and what we found is that there's some minor 
air bubbles that have been introduced uh, into the part. Uh, but visually, you look at that part, you can't you can't see that. So if you ever wanted to take that process and apply it to something more for like a structural component or a minor loaded component, that'd be a really good machine to have to inspect that and understand if there's any type of voids in there. So all in all, it was really insightful. Um, <laughs> yeah, being able to take a look inside of our parts. Yeah, sometimes you find things you don't want to find, right? That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in, in fact, we, we scanned one part and uh, there is this like foreign object. There's something that was uh, colored a little bit differently than the surrounding material. And we'd ask, you know, what, what would that indicate? Because it definitely wasn't a void. It wasn't lighter. And... Uh, They'd mentioned that it could be uh, like a foreign object that it got introduced during the process. And we do a lot of CNC machining in our shop and it's not very well contained. So we suspect that maybe a small uh, chip or like a aluminum chip got into our part. So that was interesting to kind of be able to play detective there and see what had gone on. What go on? Uh, so yeah, really interesting. Um, from that experience, I'd do you think you can go back to like your what you manufactured the uh let me get this great your honeycomb sandwich panel structure do you want to like after that experience being able to kind of go back and like reevaluate that that uh material into making it like better for your guys' standards yeah one of the so like I mentioned earlier, one of the big disadvantages with composites is that um, they can get kind of expensive and it can get uh, challenging to, you know, go through the validation process. Um, one thing you don't want to do is build up a big composite structure and then destroy it because it can be very costly. So it's nice to have that type of uh, tool in place to do more of a non-destructive type of test to understand if you're for example, getting good bonds or if uh, your honeycomb has some sort of rippling going on or if you have voids in your material. So it's a, it's a way to visually inspect it below the surface without destroying it to understand if there's something wrong with your part. So that's where I see the value of it um, coming into place for um, composites manufacturing is that non-destructive element to it. Anytime you don't have to destroy your composite parts is a good is a good day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For sure, that's like your labor. <laughs> All right, Bill. What do yeah, you have no, was, up your sleeve? Again, uh, changing subjects a little bit. Asking for a friend. When are you guys uh, shipping product? Yeah, we're so right now the team and I are working through the the main gear of the aircraft. So it's a tricycle configuration. So we have uh, one wheel in front and then two in back. Uh, we've got everything done. We're kind of working our way back through the aircraft, um, starting from the front, working back. So we have the nose gear all wrapped up. And now we're working on the main gear. And the main gear supports roughly 80% of the load of the aircraft. So there, it's a really important structure to get right. So we're kind of yeah. taking our time with it. Um, once we get that wrapped up, we're going to go right into uh, engine startup and taxi testing. And then get into flight testing, hopefully shortly after that, pending no major issues. And then springtime uh, next year, we, if everything goes well and there's no major anomalies or surprises that come out of uh, flight testing, we would go pretty much right into production for the aircraft, um, kind of in parallel to doing the R&D and developing the prototype, we've been building up all the production tooling uh, for it. So hopefully springtime next year, pending no big roadblocks for us. So do you have to build, do you have to build a kit and fly it before you can sell it? Uh, so for us, we have to we have to build up at least one aircraft and prove that it is capable of doing what we market it as doing. Uh, yeah. And then after that, we'd be going into building uh, the, the kits themselves. So we wouldn't actually be building the entire aircraft. We'd be building up the parts and then shipping them. Sure. Sure. Uh, there's this uh, thing that 
builders can request it's called build assist where they kind of work with a um, like a third party program where they they go to a shop and they kind of assist them so they have a workspace and they have tables and they have space to and, the, and tooling to kind of help them accelerate the build process so that's something that we might explore um, with like a third party to kind of improve that build experience even more for them so if you're someone who's like i really like your plane and i really want to fly it but i don't necessarily want to um you know take on the risk or the uncertainty of building an entire aircraft i can i can work with this third party of, of individuals to help me get it across the finish line very cool very very interesting and what do you need to do to certify the the plane you know, to fly in california or somewhere else it, I'm familiar with like registering cars, right? How, how does it work for airplanes? Is it pretty much the same? Yeah. So it's kind of similar. Like the car analogy is really good because I think people are pretty familiar with that. But like you have to have a, a pilot's license, kind of like you'd have to have a driver's license. So you need a private pilot license and you can get that independently of owning the aircraft. You don't need to get it with the aircraft in hand. You can get that flying in a flight school. Uh, once you have that, it's kind of like having your driver's license. You can go out and fly different aircraft if you want. Um, for the aircraft itself, after you have it built, you'll have to prove to the FAA that you actually built at least 51% of it. So you'd show them your build log and kind of the process that you went through. So it's just a matter of taking notes and kind of a photo log, really, of your build process. And then... Um, the aircraft itself would have to be registered as an amateur experimental built aircraft. And then there's different kind of phases that you go through with it. You do some initial flight testing with it. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, some some of the regulations are changing a little bit around this, but there's a like 40 hour flight minimum that you have to do. And they'll give you a, a flight radius to fly in to kind of um, validate the, the aircraft is airworthy. And then after that, you're you kind of let loose. You can you can fly your aircraft for recreation and educational purposes and fly where you want to fly. Very cool. I actually have a question from the from the um, from our our guests that are, are coming. Up. Sure. Yeah. So this is Omar. This is he's probably asking uh, for his friend because his friend is a, is a pilot, a helicopter pilot. Um, will there be any available assistance from a support support team during the building process? And do you foresee a lot of customers needing help during the building process? Yeah, so typically how this works is there's a what's called like a builder community. It's our first kind of 10 reservation holders, if you will, are are people that were really gonna kind of become the foundation of that uh, yeah. build that builders group um, that will help answer questions and and assist other builders in their process. So we'll have like a forum, if you will, like a Facebook forum or a dark arrow forum yeah. where you go and you're like, Hey, I'm on chapter two and I don't quite understand this, but can anyone help me clarify? Do I use an AN five or an AN four, you know, that type of stuff. So um, definitely going to be able uh, have to build up a support network after people start building the aircraft, but it, it kind of becomes a little bit of a community, if you will, of, um, yeah. of builders that want to help one another, or at least that's our, Kind of our vision for it um and then beyond that i was mentioning earlier like the build assist where you kind of have a, a third party that helps walk you through the build process if you get hung up and uh, gives you facility and tools and, and resources to uh to complete your build if you're intimidated or you know you don't have the space to do it yeah this community is very powerful but again going back to the car a car, car kit analogy those uh, builder forums are, are everything because there's just so much you can document in a manual, right? And there's a lot of details that you only learn after you build yeah. a car or, or an airplane. Yes, it's huge. And the, and the way that we've kind of intend to structure the build process is that you start out very easy with it. You're not going to jump right into, you know, bonding up a couple things on the wing or like the primary structures you're going to start small and then you kind of work your way up to the larger uh systems as you gain more confidence so it's something that you can get your feet wet in and not feel over intimidated by yeah 
And then as you move along, it's a lot of repetitive tasks. Like, okay, I know how to bond now. I know how to do some simple cutting with carbon fiber. I think I got the hang of this. Uh, but then if there's areas that are unclear or you just don't feel quite right about, you can always reach out to the, the builder community to, to ping off of. Or us, Dark Arrow, if you get hung up, we'll obviously be there to support you as well. Yeah. Um, this actually gives a good segue to my next question. You, uh, the next project for Dark Arrow, aside from building your kit, uh, is educational videos, right? Um, you're kind of launching that on YouTube. You want to tell us a little yeah, bit about that? Kind of, um, we've kind of been building up. We have over like 100 videos now on our YouTube channel, and it was more of just a, a, a way to uh keep kind of like our parents in the loop on where we're at with our <laughs> our this crazy project that we've actually done the also kids. You're sure some carbon fiber you built, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then to you know give an insight to where we're at with the build process and then help kind of educate people on some of this the stuff that we do behind the scenes in the shop and how the how the kit's coming together and to help people kind of gain more confidence as we're, we're going along and developing this thing. So it's been a, a fun learning experience um, for us as well, developing that aspect of the, the business and sharing that part of our story or, or our journey, if you will, kind of getting to um, where we're at today. So, yeah. Um, and then on top of that, we recently launched a aerospace composites course. Um, we get a lot of composite questions. Composites can be kind of a small community of people. And there's the camp of people who are very educated PhD types that know a lot of the theory. And then there's the camp of people that are like the techs that work in the shop day in and day out with composites. Um, we feel like we kind of create a bridge between the two where we have a lot of good um, theoretical knowledge, but we also have a lot of good hands-on knowledge and we're kind of combining that into a uh, composites course, if you will. And that's been pretty popular for people as well. It's been fun um, sharing that um, with, with different folks. So, so looking that, forward to seeing how that evolves as well. So that course is like a, a hands-on class you teach in uh, Wisconsin. Is that how it works? Yeah, that's correct. It's a two-day course um, with a combination of like lecture and, and demos for people to kind of get their hands wet. So it's been a great experience for uh, some of our deposit holders who want to gain more confidence in their build that they want to do, uh, building the Dark Arrow. And then also for hobbyists and B2B people who are exploring composites as a alternative to say metal for their product or their projects that they want to do. So it's a good intro course to getting your hands wet with composites and carbon fiber specifically. Hmm. So I think this get, will launch into Bill going from, from his car being a car enthusiast to a aircraft kit enthusiast who knows well you're always looking for something that goes faster you know if, megan if you've done it <laughs> oh yeah, yeah for sure you, instead of like uh so you're he's uh, a little segue here uh keegan his uh old ford model t unfortunately um got burnt um from a, a, like electrical uh, so oh, no. electrical and then um his project his next project is the phoenix so maybe we can actually make his next project the phoenix fly literally yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah that sounds great <laughs> so this uh well, it was your yeah. was your kit build i'm curious if your car kit build was that like a uh composite shell with a metal framework yeah, so it's a fiberglass uh, body with uh, steel uh, chassis and, and frame. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And um, nice. Uh, so you're you're familiar with composites then? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's uh, they look like this. Nice. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. That's. Yeah, so uh, I think it's it, this idea of, of uh, you know giving back to the community with this uh, composite class is just genius. I think it's it's a it's a great way to 
engage, right, a, a wider audience and, um, and, um, and share, you know, some of these amazing experiences you guys are having and all the learning with, uh, with composites. This is huge. Yeah. And I think the big thing we've, uh, we've learned from the whole process is that people, people just want to kind of like understand more about, about what's going on. And it's just fun to, to know, you know, how you got from point A to point B. And in the process of doing that, I think it helps instill a lot of trust that you're, you're kind of following this regimented, uh, kind of process to getting to where you want to go. Cause aircraft, I understand can be kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of scary, right? You're lifting your feet off the ground, you're getting up into the air. How do you know it's safe? Um, so providing that insight and how we're going about doing that to ensure that it's safe is, is a good way to kind of build that trust with community. I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, this is awesome. Well, Thank you so much, Keegan, for joining us and giving us a little bit more insight into Dark Arrow and all of things aerospace. Of course. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much, man. Appreciate Hopefully it. Hopefully we get to see it in person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. of course. Appreciate it. Thanks thank so you. much. Cool.